I'm your host, Aaron Heath, and I can take a moment and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to episode number 63 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. You can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 063. Here we are at 195 days, one hour, 56 minutes, and 50 some odd seconds. This is the time I'm, at the time I'm recording this, until open carry is legal in Texas. Now, I am going to skip the gun of the show for this episode, and I'm going to instead have something that's a throwback to the very first podcast I did. Now, for those of you who don't know what I'm referring to, I'm going to do a carry tip. And the carry tip for this episode is one of my favorites from the old podcast, and that is carry a knife. Now, a knife is one of the most useful tools that has been with man since the dawn of time. The technology has advanced from Stone Age knives to modern steel knives to high-tech ceramic knives, and some of the best knives in the world include some of the sharpest blades on the planet that come in the form of obsidian knives. Now, obsidian knives are made from a volcanic glass. The knife can be an escape tool, it can be a weapon, it can be a medical tool, a survival tool, an eating utensil, and much, much more. Carrying a knife means you might have a viable tool in places that prohibit guns should you need a weapon. Knives are some of the simplest, most versatile, and most capable tools you can have with you. And in the event of a weapons malfunction, it could be the difference in a life or death uh, result in a situation that could have killed you. And I am stuttering a little bit. I am kind of losing my focus. And that's because I got a little too hot outside today. But the thing about a knife is, when you have a knife... You have a tool that has some of the most capable features of any tool out there. If you're in a fight with your pistol, you have a factory load that actually has an that has too hot of a charge. The case swells up and gets stuck in the chamber. The extractor pulls free of the rim of the cartridge, and now your gun's out of the fight. You can't reach in there and extract the case with your finger. Now you whip out your pocket knife, flip it open, use the blade to slide the damaged case out, and you may be back in the fight. Or you transition to your backup gun. Or your threat's too close, you whip out your knife, and you cut the threat. Now, a lot of people would stop and say, well, you know, cutting somebody's not really as effective as shooting them. But if you don't have time to change, to bring your weapon back into the fight, and you're not carrying a backup gun, having another weapon, no matter how close you have to be to use it, can make the difference between living or dying. And that's why if you carry any kind of a weapon with you, you should carry a knife. Now I'm going to hit the audio clip for that tells you how to get the show. And when we come back, I'll explain why I over got overheated outside today. And I'll tell you about something that I'm doing with the uh, website and what I want to do with social media on the, for the podcast. But first let me run this audio clip so that people that just found the audio from somewhere will know how to get the show. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Myro Player, YouTube, the website, and of course, in your favorite app using the RSS feed on the website. With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website. Now, for those who have sent me a voicemail in the last, oh, I don't know, three and a half, four months, I apologize. I may or may not have responded to you because I may or may not have gotten the voicemail. Today I got a dump of about 16 or 17 voicemails that I have never, never known were out there. One of which is just a day or two old. And I apologize for this. I don't know what was going on, but Google was not obviously playing well or playing nice. And I I am working on responding to people. I think I'm up to number five. So. Please forgive me. I am catching up on these. And the one that kind of, I think, broke the camel's back and made Google send all of them out is a gentleman from California by the name of Scott. And I want to thank him for leaving his voicemail. I haven't listened to it. I have not. Well, I tried to read the Google uh, speech to text on it, but it said something about hiccuping cars. So I don't think it's right. But I am responding to these in the order that I received them. And if you have not heard from me and you left me a voicemail, I apologize. 
some of these I'm not going to respond to because they are from the same person or the same people that I have dealt with in the past. And I have addressed their issues already. So those I will not respond to. However, if you have responded or if you left me a voicemail, I have not responded. Yes, I am going to get back to you. And I apologize for the late reply. But moving on, I was outside today and I got a little bit too hot. And the reason I got a little bit too hot, I'm not used to working in hot and humid weather. Out here in West Texas, it's hot and dry normally. Right now, because we have had so much rain, it's hot and humid. We actually have water laying on the ground in places out here. And that is not normal. They're called a rayus. Or, I'm sorry, I mispronounced it. This is why I do not speak anything other than English, because I, I butcher English enough as it is. Or no, they're called playa lakes. That's what they're called. And these playa lakes and these playa ponds normally do not have water. In fact, very rarely do they have water, and when they do have water, it doesn't stick around long. However, we have several of these around where I live, and it's been about a week since we got any real quantities of rain, and these things are still full or over full. I do not like this. I do not like this at all, because it's not normal. Unfortunately for me, I got too hot, and while I... While normally the body sweats and the sweat evaporates and cools you down, that did not happen because the sweat stayed on me, and I got too hot. And I spent most of my day inside, under the air conditioner, trying to cool down where I wouldn't have a heat stroke. And now I'm sitting under a ceiling fan that looks like it's going to fall and hit me. For those of you who have had a ceiling fan before, you understand. And for those who may be wondering, why am I sitting under a ceiling fan when I have an air conditioner? Well, I'd like you to hear my voice and not the sound of the air conditioner. The microphone will focus on the air conditioner if I have it on, so, or actually if I have the air conditioner where it blows on me. So I have closed the vent in the, the room I record, shut the door, and now you can hear my voice and not the air conditioner. So we have covered the voicemail issue. Why I may seem distracted and, well, not normal today. So that leaves two things. And of those, the least important and the one that'll happen eventually, I plan to change the header page or the header images on on, the, on all the social media for the podcast. Well, the reason for that is they're out of date. I want them all to look similar, and I don't want the one on Facebook to, well, still be the, about the legislature since the legislature's out of session. In order to facilitate that, I'm going to have to do this when I have time, and that may be two weeks down the road. But it may happen sooner than that. I don't know. And the final thing I want to touch on as far as the show news and announcements, on the front page of the Gun Rights in Texas website is a countdown timer. And at the time I'm recording this, well, you heard me count off the number of days, hours, and minutes, and seconds until open carry was legal. And that's from the time that I recorded this. And I actually read that off the timer on the front page of the website. For those of you who don't know, the website is gunrightsintexas.com. With that said, I think I need to move on. Hit the audio clip that tells you basically how to follow the show on social media, since I did mention it. Then we'll come back with our primary topic, and, well, we'll go from there. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast has a social media presence. You can like it on Facebook, you can follow it on Twitter, you can circle it on Google+, and you can follow it on Instagram. With all those options, let's get social. Now, while we're being social, let's not be too social and become all buddy-buddy with groups and organizations that don't deserve our money. And just to kick things off, let's take a look at some national groups. These are national-level groups and organizations, and we're going to look at them and we're going to consider whether or not they are worth our time and money. And the first one we're going to look at is Gun Owners of America. I looked, and I really did look. I tried to find some important link for them to have to Texas. And the most, and I'll be honest, the most significant link I could find was where they were endorsed by Ron Paul, and they have it up on the front page of their website. Now, they don't have any Texas lobbyists registered, so that means their lobbyists are either not following the law or they're not being as effective as they could be. I have yet to see anything that Gun Owners of America can actually claim they did, and I'll leave it at that. Then we have Gun Rights Across America, GRAA, and they started out here in Texas, and they 
I think they have a director for each state and it's a weird system that they appear to operate under. I'm not going to try to figure it out, but I am going to say they have no registered Texas lobbyists. So either they're not lobbying, they're lobbying illegally, or they're just not being very effective at lobbying. And then we come to the National Association for Gun Rights. And these guys, well, you ought to, you ought to do a search for NAGR followed by a space and then SAF followed by a space. And then for good measure, type in Dudley Brown. You can find a rant by the Second Amendment Foundation about NAGR trying to claim credit for work that the Second Amendment Foundation did. And then, well, it goes from there. In fact, if you're, if you haven't been living under a rock, you may have noticed uh, this email that went out from the NRA about a Florida group. Well, that Florida group is an associate is an associate group, state level associate of NAGR. In all reality, it looks to me like this state level of affiliate or associate Florida gun rights is just a sponge to soak up more money. Now, I can't say that for a fact, but that's what it looks like. And we'll touch on their Texas affiliates in a, later on when we get to the state level groups. Now, NAGR does not have a registered Texas lobbyist. That means they're not lobbying in Texas or they're lobbying illegally, or they're not lobbying effectively. Now, we do have one organization that does have a registered lobbyist here in Texas at the national level, and that would be the National Rifle Association. Now, the NRA is probably the biggest, and I know they're the oldest civil rights organization out there. The NRA is possibly one of the most effective lobbying organizations on the planet, and If you're going to support anybody, I recommend supporting them first simply because the more power you have over them, the more control you have to make them go your way. That means you should be a lifetime member. And then we have the Second Amendment Foundation. Now, the Second Amendment Foundation is not much of a lobbying organization. They tend to lobby in their home area, and that's about it. However, they are a litigation uh, factory, I guess you could call them. And they like to litigate Second Amendment issues, and they're good at it. They may not be as good as they could be, but they tend to get the cases to the right places, and then those cases usually seem to get won. And that pretty much wraps up our state or our national level groups, and then we come to our state level groups. And our state level groups, we're going to do them in alphabetical order like we did the national level groups, and we'll kick it off with Katie. Katie is come and take it. And I'm talking about the gun rights group and not the podcast. However, if you are interested in listening to the Katie podcast or the come and take it podcast, go over to brainstaple.com and you can listen to them talk about Texas history. They've had, at the time I'm recording this, the most current episode is number is a number four of a four part series on Texas rising. I like their podcast and they're, they're a great bunch of guys. And oddly enough, they tend to be friends with gun people. Go figure. Oh, wait, they're about Texas, so they got to be friends with gun people. And that's a joke. Well, maybe. Maybe it's not. But anyways, the state-level groups, and we're kicking it off with Come and Take It. Well, Come and Take It has no registered Texas lobbyist. I don't think if they had one, he would be very well received. And I'm not going to go into what not having a registered Texas lobbyist means because, well, you heard me say it several times at the national level groups. Now, come and take it. They're closely associated with the website don'tComply.com. And Don't Comply is probably not a website that you uh, really want to be affiliated with if you're a lobbyist. And that's just based on the name of the website. I'll let you go to Don't Comply and figure out for yourself that, figure out for yourself if that's what you want to do. Oddly enough, I can't seem to access don'tComply.com, so I was going to look it up and mention it in a moment, but hmm, their Facebook page is up and alive. Hmm, how weird. I don't know if their website's broken, been taken down, or what. Anyways, the website's don'tComply.com, and you can check that out. And they do have, they have this multi-phase program going on for open carry. And part of this is uh, what they call a Glock sock. And that thing is truly irritating as far as how they describe it. Essentially, they're, they're making themselves into a 
civil disobedience group. And Katie does also do this uh, open carry zone that's portable where it's completely enclosed. I don't really get the idea behind why you would do that, but okay. Sometimes the protest concepts just don't make sense. And maybe they should. The next group is Lone Star Gun Rights. Lone Star Gun Rights is a new organization, not to be confused with the Lone Star Citizens Defense League, which is no longer exist in existence. But Lone Star Gun Rights is, well, their website's LoneStarGR.com. Hey, Don'tComply.com finally loaded. You just may have to wait. Uh, you may have to wait a few minutes to get that website to load. But Lone Star Gun Rights has a slogan: "We defend your 2A rights," meaning the Second Amendment. Their website's designed primarily for mobile, it looks like. And their about page, I don't really understand. Projects, I don't understand. The blog, I don't understand. It's all in a foreign language. You go to the contacts and it shows New York. I really don't think they, I think they're in the process of redoing or launching a website. So we're not going to really talk about them very much. These folks need help. From a good web designer, because their website's pretty much broken. Okay. Whatever their uh, CMS is, it shows live help is displayed for demo purposes only. To add it to your store, please refer to the template documentation or OLARC live chat official website. Okay. Yeah, whatever this thing is for their website, it's broken. In fact, I think I may just quit going to the different groups' websites. But Lone Star Gun Rights does not have a registered Texas lobbyist. And you can determine what that means for yourself because I've told you what I think it could mean in three different instances what it could mean. And we'll move on to Open Carry Texas. I'm not going to touch on Open Carry Texas too much because in the near future, I want to do an episode about Open Carry Texas, CJ Grisham, and all the confusion I have with the group and the leader. Now, Open Carry Texas does not have a registered Texas lobbyist, and you can take that for whatever you think it means. I will say they do have a legislative director. I searched for his name. I searched for C.J. Grisham's name. I got nothing. I searched for the group's name, as I did with all the others, and got nothing. And we know Open Carry Texas was there lobbying. So, were they lobbying illegally, or... Were they lobbying ineffectively? And then you have Open Carry Tarrant County. And we know they were there lobbying as well. And if you want proof of that, just go look for Corey Watkins' Foot in the Door video. Or Corey Watkins' Poncho Navarra's video. Either, either way, we'll get you the same video. However, they too have no registered Texas lobbyist. And I did search for Corey Watkins' name, and I did search for the group's name. Then we come to Texas Carry, which is Pastor Terry Holcomb's website uh, group. And, well, Texas Carry also has no registered Texas lobbyist. Are you starting to see a pattern here? And we know Terry Holcomb was there lobbying, so he was either lobbying less effectively than he could, or he was lobbying illegally. And then we come to a group that actually has a registered Texas lobbyist. And that group would be the Texas State Rifle Association, or the TSRA. Now, their registered lobbyist is Alice Tripp, and she's a great lady. The two times I've talked to her on the phone, I have enjoyed it. You got to hear one of them on, on episode 10 of the Open Carry Report, which is what this podcast was called before it became the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Now, the TSRA is a great organization. They do lobby, and they do it very well. And all I can say is, if you really want, if you want a group that can sit down and show you results, the TSRA is it. Then we have one more group we're going to talk about, and that's TX Gun Rights. I do not like these people. I have issues stemming from their similarity of name to mine. They are associated with the National Association for Gun Rights. And earlier I talked about a email from the NRA talking about uh, Florida gun rights. Well, this is their Texas equivalent. And oddly enough, they have no registered Texas lobbyist. What I do find interesting is they do advertise themselves as Texas as the largest. Well, let me just, I said I wasn't going to look on their websites again, but I'm going to anyway. The Lone Star State's largest no compromise gun rights organization. That's what they build themselves as. Now you may be thinking, 
Really? But doesn't Open Carry Texas claim they're the biggest no compromise gun rights organization? And aren't they also a NAGR affiliate? Or at least closely affiliated with them? If I was Open Carry Texas or CJ Grisham, I'd be kind of insulted by this. But then again, Open Carry Texas and the National Association for Gun Rights tends to be a little buddy buddy. And they may overlook little things like this, so we'll move on. Now, in the different organizations that have lobbyists for gun rights, there is one other gun rights lobbyist registered in the state of Texas, but they're registered for an anti gun group. So you've got one anti gun lobbyist registered in the state, and then you have two pro gun lobbyists registered in the state, and all these new little groups are out there lobbying. I don't know if they just did not know what they had to do to be a lobbyist, or maybe they didn't care, or maybe they knew and they knew that if they didn't lobby as effectively as they could, then they could avoid having to register. Whatever it is, I don't know. But none of these groups really stand out as far as being effective if they don't have a registered lobbyist. I don't know about you, but if it were me, and I had a limited amount of money like I do, and I wanted to support a group that could effectively lobby to get gun rights out there and to advance gun rights, I think it'd be the NRA and the TSRA. And I know people be, well, they compromise. Really? They did? They, they advanced the ball. They didn't trade something we already have for something we don't have. If you walk up and you tell somebody, I want half your cake, and they give it to you, you didn't compromise. If they walk up, tell them you want half their cake, and they say, well, I'll give you a quarter, and you say yes, you still have got more than you had when you started, and you did compromise. If you walk up and tell them, I want half your cake, and they say, okay, but you have to give me your car, you have a lot less than what you started with. No compromise, smart compromise, and foolish compromise are entirely different things. If you go up and tell somebody, I want your cake, or I want half your cake, and they say no, and you stand there and hold your breath, and you don't get anything, you didn't compromise, and you didn't get any cake. And on that note, I'm going to hit the audio clip that tells you how to contact me, and after that, we'll come back to the news. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com. Or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. I believe it's in Odessa, Texas. However, our first news story comes to us from the Midland Odessa area, and we have a candidate for Criminal Mastermind of the Year. And, well, this candidate has been arrested for the burglary of a gun store. Now, the suspect was found to be in possession of the firearms, or at least some of the firearms, when he was arrested, so they can pretty much say, yes, this is the man that stole these guns. Now, the reason I say he's a candidate for Criminal Mastermind of the Year, they have video, he runs up, takes his left hand, and he's got this full sleeve tattoo on it, no glove, and he tries to rip the camera down. And you get to see his face, his tattoo, and he obviously left fingerprints all over the place. And to make matters worse, he kind of left video showing who he was and where to look to find his fingerprints. Yeah, this guy was, I mean, he's a good candidate for criminal mastermind of the year here. Now, I don't know if it's the same one, but about, a, I want to say about a year ago, he was arrested. If it's who I, if it then, because somebody with the same name was arrested, you know, uh, relating, well, They were involved in a fatal car accident where someone was killed. And apparently it was the person with the same name as this particular criminal mastermind. So he may, he may be, uh, facing, he may be on probation or he may be facing felony charges off that. I don't know. I didn't bother researching him too much because, well, he's not worth my time. Now we have a suspect. Now, we have another story where a suspect tied to the shootings at the Draw Mohammed contest is reported as wanting to attack the Super Bowl. Now, this is a third suspect that was not present in the attack, and he has been taken into custody. And he is also from Phoenix. That would be Phoenix, Arizona. 
And our final news story, and this one's kind of a political one, starting September 1st, anytime an officer is involved in a shooting, the departments involved will be required to submit a report to the Texas Attorney General's office, which will compile a report that will be available on the Attorney General's website. The law does require a report filed anytime an officer shoots someone or is shot themselves. And information that's gathered off this report will include race and things like that. Essentially, I'm not too sure this is going to be anything worth while, but then again, it could prove useful. I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. But the legislature passed it, and it's law. So let's see where it goes, and we'll run with it, and hopefully we'll have a We'll have something useful out of this. Now, for those of you who are not living under a rock, you're probably aware of the church shooting in, uh, I believe it was Char- Charleston, South Carolina. Mm, well, I'm uh, sorry about that. I was picking up some stuff I dropped. I hope I hope it didn't come across the m- microphone. But I believe it was Charleston, South Carolina, where uh, mm, I'm missing that page. It went somewhere I can't see it. But anyways... It was a church shooting. The suspect kind of, well, he kind of fled and then surrendered. And overall, well, in the end, he was arrested. And now they're in the process of figuring out why he did it, uh, if he had help, and things like that. And I want to use this as our scenario for episode 63, which will be after the sign-off music. So if you want to hear the training scenario... For episode 63, stick around after the sign-off music. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly. I found the last page of my show notes while the music was playing, and then I scooted my desk back to where it belonged. Well, here's the shooting scenario. I had originally intended to do it before the sign-off music, but I'm going to go ahead and do it after the sign-off music like I did the last one, and we'll probably leave it here for long term because it just feels better here. So, episode 63 scenario, church shooting. You're visiting a church. It's not your regular church. In fact, you don't really know anyone in this church. Maybe you just moved to the community or maybe a customer where you work or a coworker at a new job. Hey, why don't you come to my church? So you really don't know anybody and you really don't know the church layout that well. It's your first time in here and an armed attacker comes in and begins to kill or wound the congregation. You do have your legally concealed handgun on you, but you don't know who in the church is also armed, nor do you have any clue if they have a plan or procedure in place for this type of event. What do you do? Let's give you a little bit of a background on concealed carry in churches in Texas right now. Texas Penal Code does set churches as being off-limits for concealed carry, but they're only off-limits if they actually post a 30-06 notice. They can include it in their little church bulletin. They can put up a sign or they can give you verbal notice, but they have to give you notice under Penal Code Section 30-06 if they want you to be disarmed. Now, another factor on Texas uh, churches, and this is something that's near and dear to Charles Cotton, is the fact that church security teams cannot be, you cannot have an armed security team for a church. Because if you do that, it has to be a, they have to be licensed through T-Close. So a lot of these church security teams are just unarmed volunteers that are basically willing to try and herd people out of the way of gunfire or uh, or a crazed lunatic that may be stabbing people. Or maybe they're just volunteers that are willing to mass dial 911. I don't know. But a lot of churches go ahead and do have security teams that are made up of off-duty law enforcement or uh, other T-close licensed individuals. Some churches, the larger mega churches, may even have actual armed security. However, it is illegal for them to have unlicensed armed security. And I do know there have been several bills introduced in the past to address this issue. 
if you want to find out more, just go to church, go to texaschlforum.com and do a Google search, or not a Google search, do a forum search for church security team, and you'll find a lot of information on them. But the purpose of these scenarios is not to have you go out and practice them. They're to get you to think and get you to decide what would your course of action be. Do you wait and see if anybody else engages the attacker? And if not, do you attack the attacker yourself? Or do you engage the attacker immediately? And what if the church has somebody in there that's armed? Do they mistake you for a second attacker? And how do you deal with that? These are things you'd have to think about in this scenario. And you have to, you have to address this with, from a training perspective. And if you cannot come up with a way to get out of this alive and unharmed, then maybe you need to go seek out professional training. Now, we're not going to endorse anybody for this type of training. That's up to you to decide. And with that said, let me say, please stay safe and carry responsibly.